We are all living through a watershed moment in history. I truly do think that. Today, around the planet, we are seeing that global politics and economics are fundamentally shifting. The war in Ukraine is just one small part of this tectonic shift that we're seeing. Really, the way I think it can be most simply expressed is that for hundreds of years, Western colonialist powers dominated the entire world. First, the European colonialists, then the U.S. empire. And that system is breaking apart with the rise of Asia and in general, the rise of the global south but especially with the integration of Asia, or people say Eurasia because Russia's part of it, although we're increasingly seeing that Russia has been basically kicked out of Europe. So it's not really Eurasian integration, it's really just Asian integration. And today I'm talking about the further integration of Russia and Iran. Of course, China plays a very important part of this. And we're basically seeing the emergence of a China, Russia, Iran, Eurasian or Asian alliance I'll talk about that later. I mean, this is exactly what U.S. imperial strategists like Zbigniew Brzezinski, former national security advisor, this is exactly what he warned about. This is what Henry Kissinger warned about. And we're seeing this kind of alliance emerge. This July, Russian President Vladimir Putin took a historic trip to Iran. They signed a series of agreements in terms of energy cooperation. They called for dropping the U.S. dollar from global trade and are going to push for global de-dollarization. And they also talked about something that is getting even less attention, which is the International North-South Transport Corridor, INSTC, which is a way to integrate trade among Asian countries, specifically integrating trade between India, Iran, and Russia. So not only does this involve China, it also involves India. So between China, which has the largest population on Earth, 1.4 billion, India, which has the second largest population, also around 1.4 billion, and then you throw in Russia and Iran, we're talking about 3 billion people. We're talking about, you know, around 40% of the global population, over one third of the global population. And yet, it gets so little coverage in the West. It, it really does shock me how little coverage these world historic events that we're seeing happening get in the Western media. Of course, we know that Western media outlets are largely just propaganda vehicles, so they're probably not reporting on it because it shows the, the increasing weakness of US-led imperialism and European imperialism. But anyway, I wanna go now to highlight some of the details of this historic trip that Russian President Vladimir Putin just took to Tehran. Now, this was reportedly Putin's first trip to a country that, ha that had not been part of the Soviet Union since the COVID pandemic. Um, his most recent trip before that was China, of course, a major ally of Russia. And now he has visited Iran. So it really pr shows the priorities of Moscow increasing its collaboration with both China and Iran as part of this overall China-Russia-Iran alliance. I'm going to look at some of these statements from the Iranian government because I think they're very revealing. The Iranian government says very clearly what its goals are. It says what it, what it feels. Um, I, I find the honesty of its diplomacy very refreshing, unlike these Western governments that always try to quote what they say in this propaganda and you know this ridiculous rhetoric that disguises what they're actually saying or thinking and doing. Well, Iran is very honest about its foreign policy and it's very clear. They say that we are allying with Russia and also China to challenge Western imperialism. And here is a statement, an incredible statement, published at the website of Iran's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei who is the supreme leader, the lead, they refer to him as the leader of the Islamic Revolution. And this is from July 19th, the day that Russian President Putin visited Tehran. He met with the uh, Iranian Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and he also met with Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi. And the name of this, this press release on the Ayatollah's website is dollar must be removed from global transactions. So we see the issue that's really heavily emphasized here, de-dollarization, drop the US dollar, end US dollar hegemony. So it discusses this meeting that was held on July 19th. 
And Imam Khamenei stressed that world events show the need for Iran and Russia to increase mutual cooperation. So this is the leader of the Islamic Revolution calling for strengthening relations between Moscow and Tehran. And he said specifically in the oil and gas sectors and overall expanding economic cooperation. Now, what he was referring to there was uh, were memorandums, mem memorandums of understanding that were signed between Iran's and Russia's state-owned energy companies. Here is a wire that was published on July 19th in Reuters. Iran and Russia's Gazprom signed primary deal for energy cooperation. It notes that the two state-owned energy giants, the National Iranian Oil Company and Gazprom, again, both of which are public state-owned companies, not private companies, they signed a memorandum of understanding worth $40 billion. And this includes a Russia, Russia's Gazprom is going to help Iran develop gas fields, including the Kish and North Pars gas fields. I'll show that in a second. Russia is also going to help Iran develop six oil fields. And Russia is going to be involved in completing a liquefied natural gas, various liquefied natural gas projects, LNG, and the construction of gas export pipelines. So this is a very important agreement. Again, it's worth $40 billion. And this is part of a larger process of economic integration of Iran and Russia, as I'll discuss in a second in what I talked about earlier, the International North-South Transport Corridor. Before I, before I get to that, a few other details. Iran has the second largest gas reserves in the world after Russia. So while we're dealing with this moment where European countries are telling their populations they're going to have to have cold showers, they're going to have to, uh, you know, conserve their use of gas, they're going to have to turn down their thermostats in, in the winter, turn up their thermostats in the summer. Meanwhile, you know, they're refusing to buy Russian energy. And of course, the U.S. has sanctions on Iran, which also prevents many Europeans from buying energy from Iran because they're afraid of secondary sanctions from the U.S. So the U.S. has these massive economic war campaigns and sanctions, which are illegal under international law against Russia, Iran and Venezuela. Venezuela has the world's largest oil reserves. Russia is one of the world's largest exporters of oil and gas. Iran is a significant producer of oil and has the world's second largest gas reserves. So the, the U.S. is is destroying Europe's economy, causing these massive increases in energy prices in order to prevent, to try to destroy Russia. I mean, it, it, it really is incredible. But anyway, getting back to this meeting between Russia and Iran here. So Ali Khamenei called for increasing economic cooperation. And he, of course, pointed out that Russia and Iran are both heavily targeted by Western sanctions. So it's in their mutual interest to challenge those those Western sanctions by increasing Asian integration. And he also expressed support for the Russian side of the proxy war against NATO. And Ali Khamenei described NATO as being a dangerous entity. And he said, quote, if the way is open for NATO, it will recognize no limits. If it hadn't been stopped in Ukraine, it would have later started a similar war in Crimea. And we did see Ukraine's Western-backed leader, Vladimir Zelensky. He, before Russia sent its troops in in February, he had repeatedly said that Ukraine was committed to militarily retaking Crimea, which had a democratic referendum in which over 90% of people in Crimea wanted to become part of Russia. So anyway, I mean, uh, uh, this is a clear sign of, of Iran opposing the U.S.-led NATO military cartel. And we also see that Iran is calling for expelling the U.S. military occupiers from Syria and in general from the region, from West Asia. And he said another important issue in Syria is the usurping of fertile oil-rich regions to the east of the Euphrates by the Americans. He's talking about the oil-rich regions of Syria, which are being illegally occupied by the U.S. military. And the Iranian le uh, supreme leader said this should be solved by expelling them, that is the U.S. military occupiers, from the region. So, again, very strong, very strong statement. 
Now, here's another statement that did, hasn't gotten a lot of coverage in the media, but is extremely important. I mean, once again, this is a tectonic shift that could change global trade and move the center of the global economy away from the West and this transatlantic alliance and back toward Asia, where it was concentrated before the rise of European colonialism. So once again, once again I mean, I'm stressing the historic shift we're seeing of the global economy back to Asia, reversing this process of Western colonialism that has dominated the global economy for centuries. And in this meeting between the Russian leader and the Iranian supreme leader and Iranian president, we saw that Khamenei stressed the necessity of launching a Rasht Astara railway line. I'll show that in a second. I'll show a map of that. Stating that this will help finish the north-south transit line and be of advantage to both countries. This is extremely important. Here is a report in Silk Road Briefing, which focuses on the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative and the integration of Asia, the creation of the new Silk Road. This is from July of 2022. Iran's Rasht Astara Railway to provide the key link in the INSTC. Some people say NSTC. Uh, this is the International North-South Transport Corridor. And this is the INSTC, INSTC, International North-South Transport Corridor. And you can see here, it will connect India down in the south, and there will be a maritime route going through Iran, and then there's this proposed railroad here that will connect India to Iran, and then the southern port of Iran going north to the Caspian Sea, and then into Russia, and also other countries here around the Caspian. So this is an extremely important project. And on this map that I'm showing, you can see the railroad that's proposed. That railroad is the Rasht Astara Railway, which Iran's Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei has called for expediting the, the construction of. So here, and I'm going to just summarize this from this report from the Silk Road. It notes that the Rasht Astara railway line running between the southern Iranian port at Shahid Rajai, here you can see it on the map here, Shahid Rajai, which is the port in the south, connecting it to the north to Rasht, the Rasht port on the Caspian Sea. It will provide full railway connectivity between, between the Gulf and Europe. Well, increasingly, it's not really going to be Europe so much. It's more going to be Russia and maybe even Turkey. So Iran's goal is, to, this is a statement from the Iranian Minister of Roads and Urban Development. He said, Iran's goal is to connect to the Caucasus, Russia, and European countries. And this is part of the North-South Transport Corridor, the, the INSTC, which was laid, the basis of this was laid in 2000 between Russia, Iran, and India. Of course, a lot has has changed between 2000 and 2022 and the role of Europe in this seems like it's no longer going to, to be relevant it's probably going to be more about integrating trade in Asia between India Iran and Russia and perhaps Turkey and these other countries in Central Asia you know Turkmenistan potentially Afghanistan Iraq Azerbaijan Armenia but anyway the purpose of creating this corridor is to reduce the delivery time of cargo from India to Russia. Right now, delivery time on the current route is more than six weeks, but it's expected to be cut in half by the INSTC, the International North-South Transport Corridor. Originally, according to the guidelines that were signed, the construction of the Rosh Star railway line in Iran was supposed to be done by 2025, but now we see that Iran and Russia are hoping to expedite that. So this is the map of the INSTC, International North-South Transport Corridor. You can see the south in India connecting through Iran. So I was talking about this route here, which is going from south to, from, through Indi from India through Iran. You can see also the Suez Canal route. And you can see that this is the route that takes six weeks. It's twice as long. You can see clearly that going through Iran will have that, that route, make it much quicker. 
and it would also help to economically um, you know, strengthen the local economies in these countries surrounding the Caspian because now when it goes through the Suez, of course, the it stops in other parts of Europe and Turkey. And of course, those countries that are that are stops, the ports that are stops on the route are also economically benefit benefiting. It's not just the first and final destination, it's also the countries on that route. So what we're seeing is the further integration of these Asian economies. Now, the real outlier in this, I think, is India. India is a wild card. It does have a government, a very right-wing government, that is pro, very pro-U.S. India is a member of the Quad, which is the U.S.-led anti-China military alliance with Japan and Australia. But India also has very good relations with Russia. So India is not going to sacrifice its economic relations with Russia. We see that India has continued buying oil and wheat from Russia, refusing to impose sanctions. So it's a complicated game here because India and China have very negative relations. India and its relations with Iran have been hurt. Ira India was one of the main importers of Iranian oil, but because of the threat of Western sanctions, India has actually has decreased its import of Iranian energy because of the threat of U.S. secondary sanctions. So India is really the the one key player here that could be a potential complicating factor in this process of Asian integration. But clearly, China, Russia, and Iran are all on board in this process. Now, getting back to this report on Putin's meeting in Tehran, we also see that uh, uh, Ali Khamenei made this statement saying that, um, stressing that Russia should cut its ties even further with the U.S. I mean, it doesn't really even have ties. And Ali Khamenei said, the Americans are both aggressive and deceitful. One of the factors leading to the collapse of the former Soviet Union was them being deceived by U.S. policies, which is an interesting point. I mean, it's true. The Soviet leadership, especially under Gorbachev, was very naive and they thought that the West, the Western imperialists, would allow peaceful coexistence with them, going back to Khrushchev, right? The idea of peaceful coexistence, that the Soviet Union no longer had to challenge Western imperialism, it could have peaceful coexistence. Well, we saw that Gorbachev just completely sold out the Soviet Union and, and basically handed over the keys to global dominance to the U.S. empire by just basically selling out his country. And, you know, I don't know how much of it was De de being deceived by the U.S. or just willingly selling his country out to the U.S. But certainly there were people in the Soviet Union who were very naive about Western intentions and its goal eventually just to simply break up Russia. I mean, I've done for people who are interested, I did a video about that. The U.S. Congress just held an informational briefing calling for breaking up Russia in the name of so-called decolonization of Russia. Now here, this is coming to the point that I stressed at the beginning of this video, which is extremely important It's part of this process of de-dollarization. Iran's supreme leader, Khamenei, called to replace the dollar with national currencies and use other currencies in place of the dollar. He said, quote, the dollar should be gradually removed from global transactions. So again, a massive call for de-dollarization. For people who are interested, I've done interviews about this with the economist Michael Hudson discussing the, the, how the U.S. has weaponized the dollar around the world how the U.S. empire is predicated not only on military force and 800 military bases around the world, but also on U.S. dollar hegemony, how the U.S. has used the dollar to basically force other countries to pay for its wars and military occupations. So de-dollarization is an extremely important step toward weakening U.S. imperialism and helping to create this multipolar world. Now, here are the statements from Putin. Of course, if you're people watching this, they're probably more familiar with Putin's statements than they are with Iran's statements and with Ali Khamenei's statements. But we saw that Putin speaking about the war in Ukraine. He said, you know, he threatened, or not threatened, he, excuse me, not, he didn't threaten. He um, complained that the West is responsible for the war in Ukraine, saying that, you know, it was also NATO expansion, despite NATO's repeated promise not to expand an inch east after German reunification, which is an objective historical fact. He also, interestingly, uh, Putin said that some European countries told him that they were opposed to Ukraine becoming a member of NATO, but they only agreed to it under U.S. pressure 
And he said, this clearly shows the lack of independence in Europe. So this is him indicating that he recognizes that Europe is basically colonized U.S. territory at this point. And uh, he also made an interesting comment here about the sanctions backfiring on the West. And Putin said that the sanctions on Russia will work to the disadvantage of the West and they will lead to problems such as an increase in the price of oil and a food crisis. That is exactly what has already happened. So, I mean, he's not even just predicting it. It already has happened. And here is Russia talking about the dollarization, that, sorry, the weaponization of the U.S. dollar. He says the U.S. takes advantage of the dollar as an instrument to loot other countries and impose sanctions on them. And he said that this also is undermining U.S. hegemony because it will work to their disadvantage because global trust in the U.S. dollar has been undermined. And it's encouraging other countries to use, their, to use other currencies such as Russia and Iran and in China and even India. India has worked out a, a, a trade agreement to do trade with Russia using both the Russian ruble and the Indian rupee. And Putin said that Russia and Iran are developing new methods to use their own national currencies in their relations. So another call for de-dollarization, increasing bilateral trade in their national currencies. We see that Russia agrees with Iran and their call for expelling the U.S. military occupiers from Syria. And a very important point here, the end of this press release from the Iranian government notes that Putin called for expanding military cooperation, not only bilaterally between Russia and Iran, but trilaterally with China as well. And he referred to trilateral cooperation and military maneuvers with China. Now, Earlier this year, in January, Russia, Iran, and China did military exercises. Here's a report in U.S. government propaganda outlet, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. This is a U.S. regime state media outlet that is closely linked to the CIA. And, and the reason I brought their article up is because it shows that the U.S. government is very concerned about the growing military collaboration between Iran, Russia, and China. So again, this is from back in January. It noted that Iran, Russia, and China were holding their third joint naval drill in the Indian Ocean amid speculation that the three countries are teaming up in the face of growing regional tensions with the United States. By regional tensions, of course, this U.S. regime media outlet r r means Western hybrid war and sanctions against Russia, Iran, and China. Of course, all, all three countries are targeted by illegal Western sanctions. There is now a, a proxy, Western proxy war against Russia and Ukraine. The U.S. has carried out a hybrid war against Iran for decades, ever since the 1979 revolution. Sanctions for decades. The U.S. under Donald Trump murdered the second in command of the Iranian government, at least the second most important figure in the Iranian government, uh, Qasem Soleimani. Uh, so, I mean, th this is, uh, you know, this is an alliance based on the Western hybrid war waged against them. I'll come back to that in a second, by the way. And this article in U.S. regime media notes that since coming to office in June 2021, Iran's new president, Ibrahim Raisi, has pursued a policy to deepen ties with both Moscow and Beijing. In September of 2021, Iran was accepted as a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and it's going through the process right now the you know legal uh, technical process to officially become a full member but it was already accepted so it's basically just a bureaucratic process at this point and this u.s regime media outlet it, it warns it notes that visits to iran by russian and chinese naval representatives have increased in recent years so this is part of an overall process of integration asian integration or eurasian integration of china russia and iran ironically this is exactly what U.S. imperial strategists have been warning about for decades. This is the book, The Grand Chessboard, American Primacy and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. It was written by Zbigniew Brzezinski back in 1997. This is basically a Bible for Western imperialists. It explains U.S. imperial strategy. Of course, for people who don't know, Brzezinski was the U.S. national security advisor under Jimmy Carter, U.S. President Jimmy Carter. He was an architect of the U.S. proxy war on the Soviet Union in Afghanistan in the 1980s, which helped, by the way, give birth to 
al-Qaeda and the Taliban. But of course, Brzezinski went to his deathbed defending that policy, which is known as the Afghan trap. He said that, you know, it was all about um, it was all about trapping the Russian bear and its soft underbelly is what he said. So anyway, if you if you go through this book, uh, there's a lot of interesting things in here. And maybe one day I'll do a book, uh, a video or a series of videos and podcasts kind of summarizing the main takeaways of this book. But Again, this was written in 1997. So this was written 25 years ago, and it really shows that many of the warnings that Brzezinski and other imperial strategists had about the decline of U.S. unipolar hegemony and the U.S. empire that, you know, has dominated the entire world in the 1990s, that what they warned, exactly what they warned about has come to into, come into fruition, has become a reality. So in the, in the book here, this is chapter two, he talks about the importance of maintaining the American, Japanese, Korean triangular sh security relationship. That is still very much in, in, in operation. The U.S. still has 55,000 troops occupying Japan. It still has 28,000 troops occupying South Korea. Neither country really has an independent foreign policy. They're both kind of semi-colonies of the U.S. But here there's a very interesting passage that has not aged well. And... He says the United States needs to cope with regional coalitions that seek to push America out of Eurasia, thereby threatening America's status as a global power. He notes that in the past, international affairs were largely dominated by contests between individual states, but now we're, we're seeing regional coalitions. And then he talks about some of the possible regional coalitions that could kick the U.S. out of Eurasia and threaten U.S. unipolar hegemony. And he says... Quote, the most dangerous scenario would be a grand coalition of China, Russia, and perhaps Iran, an anti-hegemonic coalition united not by ideology, but by complementary grievances. That is exactly what has happened. The Chinese-Russian-Iranian alliance. He notes that it would be similar to the, the alliance that there once was uh, the challenge once posed by the Sino-Soviet bloc, although the U.S. helped to divide that. And he notes that, that China would likely be the leader and Russia the follower. And we see that, you know, China and Russia, in February 2022, they signed this major agreement uh, for this strategic partnership, and they released this 6,000-word manifesto calling for a multipolar world. I have a video and podcast explaining that very important historic development. So that's exactly what has happened. And in this book, he also warns about the possibility of a grand European realignment involving either a German-Russian collusion or Franco-Russian Entente. And of course, that is exactly what the U.S. has been trying to avoid by forcing European countries to end their energy imports from Russia, by killing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline between Germany and Russia, by trying to force Europe to get off of Russian energy and instead be reliant on U.S. energy. It is exactly to avoid this kind of German-Russian alliance or French-Russian alliance that Brzezinski was warning about not back in 1997. He said, one could imagine an, a European-Russian accommodation to exclude the United States from the continent. Now, of course, that's, exact, that's exactly the opposite of what's happened. The U.S. has basically forced Europe to continue to subordinate itself permanently to the United States, and it's, Europe is committing economic suicide on behalf, behalf of the U.S. empire in an attempt to destroy Russia, which has pushed Russia in the arms of China, which is exactly what the, the Donald Trump administration was trying to do to try to triangulate. Henry Kissinger had tried to do this to try to bring Russia into the Western camp to ally with Russia against China. Of course, they failed to do that. And now Russia and China are clear allies and Iran is integrating further with both China and Russia. So as Brzezinski said, this is the worst case scenario for the U.S. empire. And it's exactly what is happening. Now, I should also say that in 2021, Iran and China signed a massive 25-year strategic agreement estimated at $400 billion. So while Iran is strengthening its relations with Russia, it has also been strengthening its relations with China. And of course, China and Russia have been strengthening their relations. So going back to the website of the Iranian Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, we see here that 
this is a summary that he made of the meeting between Iran and Russia. A few, few main points. So he said, calling for increasing mutual cooperation between Iran and Russia, calling for expelling the United States from Syria and West Asia in general, calling NATO a dangerous entity, and Iran's leader, uh, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, said that the West is totally opposed to a strong, independent Russia. So firm opposition to NATO and calling for increasing cooperation. So this is, this is very important. Now, there was another interesting meeting that happened on the same day, July 19th, which also, by the way, was the 43rd anniversary of the Sandinista Revolution. I have a video mini documentary that I did that you can find at multipolarista.com, or if you're watching on YouTube or Rumble or Rockfin, you can find that video here. Definitely check out my report on Nicaragua's anniversary of the Sandinista Revolution. Nicaragua plays a role in this, by the way. Who was sitting on stage alongside uh, Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega and Vice President Rosario Murillo at the, at the um, celebration of the anniversary celebration of the Sandinista Revolution? Well, on stage with the Nicaraguan leaders were representatives from China, Russia, and Iran, as well as Venezuela and Cuba. So we're seeing integration not only of Asia or Eurasia, but also integration of the, those same countries, China, Russia, and Iran, with the revolutionary socialist anti-imperialist governments in Latin America, as, who are part of the Bolivarian Alliance, the ALBA, namely Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Anyway, if you want to learn more about that, check out my document, my mini documentary, 20-minute documentary on Nicaragua's Sandinista Revolution. So anyway, interestingly, in addition to the meeting between Russian President Vladimir Putin and Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and Iranian uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, we also saw that Erdogan, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, also visited Iran and met on the same day with the Iranian leaders and with Putin. There was a trilateral meeting between the three of them. Now, clearly, the Iranian-Russian meeting Went, was very friendly. The two countries, they went along very well and they agreed on pretty much everything and there were very positive, strong statements. Clearly, the meeting between Iran and Turkey was a little more complicated. I've said many times in my analysis that Turkey plays a more complex, cagey role. Erdogan is constantly trying to play the West against the rest of Asia on the South. So Erdogan is a member, Erdogan's country, Turkey, is a member of NATO and is an ally of the US, but it also is increasing its relations with the Asian powers. So it's an interesting game that Erdogan's playing, but we see that the fact that he even visited Iran shows that Erdogan is exploring other possibilities for Turkey. Turkey is going through an economic crisis with mass inflation. So he is looking east as well as west to his diplomatic possibilities. I'm gonna summarize some of the main points of this meeting. We saw that Ayatollah Ali Khamenei called for increasing economic cooperation between Iran and Turkey. He noted that the current rate of economic, uh, economic cooperation is much lower than could be possible. So calling for expanding their trade between each other. And he also, uh, Khamenei, called for, uh, for preserving the territorial integrity of Syria. Now, this was clearly a point on which there were tensions between Ankara and Tehran. Turkey is illegally militarily occupying a huge chunk of northern Syria, and both Syria itself and its ally Iran, as well as Russia, have pledged to maintain the territorial integrity of Syria and to help Damascus retake all of that territory that is being occupied by Turkey and the Salafi jihadist extremist uh, you know, so-called rebels that are being backed by Turkey, including a rebranded Al-Qaeda affiliate, Hayat Tahrir Sham, HTS. So this was clearly a point of difference between Turkey and Iran. And Khamenei said that, he said, in, res in re re reference to re reports of an attack on Syria, of course, he's referring to reports that Turkey may be planning another attack another invasion of northern Syria. And he said, so we see clearly that the Iranian supreme leader told Erdogan to his face, do not invade Syria again. 
I mean, they've already invaded twice. Do not further attack Syria. The Iranian Supreme Leader said, quote, this would definitely be harmful to Syria, harmful to Turkey, and harmful to the region, and it would not bring about the political move Turkey expects from the Syrian government either. So he's calling for Turkey to recognize that in his argument, in Iran's argument, this is also challenging Turkey's interests. Now, of course, Turkey and Erdogan, they, they have imperial ambitions. He wants to bring back the Ottoman Empire, so he's probably going to ignore this. But it shows that he's at least pressuring Turkey to end its occupation of Syria. And uh, Khamenei also told Erdogan, you should consider Syria's security to be your own security. Syria's issues should be settled through negotiations and the dialogue between Iran, Turkey, Syria, and Russia. So this is going back to the Astana uh, agreement that was made, although Turkey violated that agreement and Turkey continues to occupy a huge chunk of northern Syria. So we're going to see where this goes. It's a complicated issue, but the fact that Erdogan went to Iran does show that Turkey is looking east as well as west. It's playing this very complicated game. Now, here are the summaries from the, the main point of this meeting between Turkey and Iran. Uh, Iran told Turkey to consider Syria's security its own security. So trying to pressure Turkey to take a, a position against, you know, invading and occupying Syria, calling for Islamic unity, of course, as two Muslim majority countries, although Turkey is majority Sunni, uh, Iran is majority Shia, calling for Islamic unity. And of course, Turkey is led by the AKP, which is Erdogan's party. And the AKP is the Turkish affiliate of the Muslim Brotherhood. So it has a different kind of outlook compared to the, the Saudi regime, which preaches a you know, Wahhabi ideology that is very against Shiism. The Muslim Brotherhood has a more complicated relation, relationship with Shia. There are sometimes extremist members of the Muslim Brotherhood who are very anti-Shia, but there also is a more moderate wing that is more sympathetic to this idea of pan-Islamic unity with Shia as well. And we also see that this, this statement, again, this stress, this stress emphasis by uh, Iran that an attack on Syria will only benefit terrorists, so don't attack Syria. And then another very important call by Iran to always support Palestinians. And of course, in all of the statements that Iran makes, and especially that Imam Ali Khamenei make, makes, they all, uh, Iran always calls for supporting the Palestinians. And he, he praised Russia because Russia has been taking actions against apartheid Israel because apartheid Israel has been backing Western imperialism and, and Ukraine in this proxy war because, of course, apartheid Israel is an extension of the U.S. empire. And we also saw that, that Ali Khamenei stressed that that uh, Turkey, of course, should never normalize relations with apartheid Israel and support Palestinians. Turkey's role in that is very complicated. Turkey does have this kind of love-hate relationship with apartheid Israel. Now, in addition to this meeting between the leaders of Iran, Russia, and Turkey in Tehran, that's a very important development, we're also seeing some economic integration of the Turkish and Russian economies. Again, Turkey plays a very complex role in this. Turkey can't really be trusted in a lot of ways. Certainly, Russia understands that Erdogan is playing both sides and Putin is always a little skeptical. But we are seeing some moves by Turkey to diversify its options, including we now see that a fifth Turkish bank has started accepting Russia's Mir payment system. This is a report in the Russian state media outlet TASS. Fifth Turkish bank starts accepting Russia's Mir cars, cards. Uh, the Mir, M-I-R, is the Russian payment system. It's the alternative to Visa and MasterCard, which are dominated by the West. And of course, with the Western economic war on Russia, they have, they have prevented many Russian banks and financial institutions and companies from using Visa and MasterCard. So that has, of course, incentivized Russia and countries that do business with Russia to find alternative payment systems. And we see that now a Turkish bank, a fifth Turkish bank, has begun accepting Mir cards. And currently, Mir cards are accepted 
not only in Turkey and Russia, but also in uh, Vietnam, Armenia, Uzbekistan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and then these breakaway republics of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. So also China plays a role in this. After the Western uh, financial war on Russia went to just a whole new level and there's these seven rounds of sanctions imposed, China and Chinese banks announced that they're working on integrating their union pay payment system with Russia's MIR payment system. Here's a report also in the Russian state media outlet TASS from March saying that some Russian banks are saying they will possibly issue co-badged cards linking Russia's MIR and China's union pay systems that will provide the option of payment for purchases and cash withdrawals abroad. Now, there's been... There's been discussion about this and it's been kind of slow getting off the ground. Clearly there's some issues to work out, but we are seeing a further integration of the Chinese and Russian economic systems. It notes that some Russian banks already operate on China's union, union pay payment system. So this is again, part of this larger process of Eurasian integration or Asian integration. Increasingly, I'm kind of preferring the term Asian integration because Europe is clearly, you know, occupied US territory at this point. Now, a few other final notes before I conclude this episode. Back in June, there was another meeting between the president of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jomart Tokayev, and the leaders of Iran, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and Imam Ali Khamenei. And that was this was in June 19th, exactly a month before the meeting by Putin and Erdogan. And this shows that Iran is strengthening its relations with countries in Central Asia, including Kazakhstan. This was also, I think, an effort by Kazakhstan to diversify its relations after a Western-backed coup attempt in January of 2022. I have a video about that and a podcast explaining the coup attempt in Kazakhstan. And uh, Khamenei called for strengthening Muslim uh, pan-Islamic unity. Of course, Kazakhstan has a very largely Muslim population. And we see that this is another example of Iran uh, supporting Russia in the Western proxy war via Ukraine. And Ali Khamenei said that concerning the issue of Ukraine, the main problem is that the West is seeking to expand NATO wherever they can without taking anything into consideration. And then he makes this, these very strong statements against Western neocolonialism and imperialism saying the U.S. and the West always seek to expand their influence in different regions, including in East and West Asia, as well as to strike a blow against countries' independence and sovereignty. So a, a strong statement against Western imperialism by Iran. Here, I mean, this is just a blatant, you know, blatantly basic map of Asia. And of course, you can see the vast majority of Russia is not in Europe. It's in Asia. I used to talk a lot more about Eurasian integration. Increasingly, I'm kind of just preferring the term Asian integration. And you can see here that Iran, which constantly uses the term West Asia, Iranian diplomats and leaders, they don't say Middle East, which is a colonial term, Eurocentric term. It's only Middle East compared to Europe, right? It's actually West Asia. Iran constantly uses the term West Asia, which is part of this idea of pan-Asian unity that has become very prominent in Iran. And here, I mean, just this, this very simple map here, you can see this integration. Integration makes perfect sense. Here's Kazakhstan, right in the middle of Russia and China, and pretty close to Iran. So we're seeing this kind of triangle emerge between Russia, China, and Iran, if you imagine drawing a triangle between them. And of course, that triangle goes between Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Central Asia, and Mongolia. Mongolia is considering becoming part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India, Pakistan, Iran, China, Russia, and the Central Asian republics are already part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So what we're seeing here is the integration of Asia here. You could say integration of Eurasia with the western part of Russia, but again, it's not really Eurasia. It's Asia. It's the integration of Asia. This is hugely important, obviously. It's a major world historic development that is going to, to change global politics for centuries. And f the last note I'm going to end on here is another statement that was made by Iran's Imam Khamenei back in April. And I think this is a good note to end 
this analysis on because I agree with the analysis. Obviously, I don't agree with some things with the Iranian government and the Iranian leadership, but I think that they have shown that they are an independent, sovereign country that is willing to act on, in the interest of their own people against Western imperialism, refusing to be colonized, and there's something very admirable about that. Iran has been one of the most consistent supporters of anti-imperialist resistance movements, not only in West Asia, including the Palestinian people, the Yemeni people, the Lebanese resistance, the Syrian and Iraqi resistance, but also Iran has been, uh, been a very important ally in supporting Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua. So Iran has been playing a very important role in challenging Western neocolonialism and imperialism. And I think their leadership clearly understand what's happening in the world. They understand the importance of integration of the global south, challenging imperialism. And it's their, their dedication to challenging Western imperialism is very admirable. And they have made sacrifices when they didn't have to in, in acts of solidarity with countries like Venezuela, Nicaragua. So it's very admirable. And the last note I'm gonna end on here is the statement made by Khamenei in April and he said, today, the world is on the threshold of a new international order, which is being formed after the failure of the bipolar order, referring to the first Cold War between the you know, U.S.-led imperialist system and the Soviet Union-led socialist bloc. And, and he also says the failure of the unipolar theory, as alleged by the Americans. So he's saying that the first Cold War with the bipolar order was a failure. The unipolar order of the U.S.-led imperialist system has been a failure. And of course, he's calling for a multipolar world. And he says, of course, the U.S. is becoming weaker on a daily basis. And he once again strength, st um, stressed the importance of supporting the Palestinians, as always, as Iran so admirably does, as the, as the world's leading supporter of Palestinian liberation. So a lot of interesting statements, a lot of interesting developments there. And it's not in any way hyperbolic to say the world is on the threshold of a new political and economic order. All we have to do is look at maps like this of the International North-South Transport Corridor or the Belt and Road Initiative or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Unfortunately, you're not going to hear about any of those in the Western media, which is why here at Multipolarista, I spend so much time researching these issues and analyzing them and trying to educate people about them because I think they're extremely important. I'll reiterate what I said at the beginning of this episode. We are living in a watershed historical moment. The hundreds of years of Western colonial domination of the planet, that, is, that order is being overturned. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a period of decades, perhaps even a century. But the process of Asian integration is a key element of weakening that Western imperialist chokehold by the U.S.-led imperialist system. And of course, the integration of Latin America is another massive part of that. And of course, the decades-long attempt at, at Pan-Africanism, which has been brutally repressed and attacked by Western imperialism, Asian unity, African unity, Latin American unity, that's the solution, obviously, to Western imperialism, to the U.S.-led imperialist system. And we are seeing huge strides being made in Asia. So as always, I'll be always returning with lots of analysis of what's happening in global politics. If you want to support the work I do, you can go to multipolarista.com slash support, or you can go to patreon.com slash multipolarista. If you're watching on YouTube or Rumble or Rockfin or Odyssey, you can find the link to the Patreon in the, the description. Please also subscribe to my channel to help fight the algorithm and suppression. And if you want to listen to a podcast version, perhaps you already are, all of these uh, episodes are available as both video and a podcast, at least the ones that are in English, because sometimes I have Spanish translations, and it's hard to have both Spanish and English in the same podcast, obviously. So thank you for watching or listening. Please consider supporting the show, and I'll see you next time.